a powerhouse of leadership and strategic thinking with experience in high stake environments from corporate giants to national boards. A former Telstra Businesswoman of the Year, she's played a pivotal role in shaping industries, guiding businesses through government, corporate and community sectors. Adrian Maud, how are you going? I'm good. How are you? I'm, I'm good. good. Um, appreciate your time today. Um, obviously, I've been talking to your husband, Tony, a bit at Rotary Club. And oh, you poor thing. <laughs> yes. And, geez, he's a character. He is. I love him. <laughs> yeah, also, I also met you a couple months ago. You're the chair of the water board too. That's right. Um, the airport. Sorry, it was yep. the airport that yep. I met you at. Um, what else are you doing today? That You seem to be doing everything. Um, well, I'm not doing a lot of um, – right now I've taken a break from community – Boards, um, because I was chair of the Gladstone Hockey Association for four years. Um, and it was time to take a break. Um, so at the moment, I'm just looking after the Airport Corporation, Gladstone Airport Corporation, the Gladstone Area Water Board, um, and I'm on a couple of committees in Brisbane. Awesome. So um, plus the McDonald's end, so that keeps me busy and raising a daughter. Hundred mm, percent. There, mm. the kids always take up absolutely the, that time there, <laughs> especially ours. Yeah, that's that's the one thing I want to kick off is time management. How do you manage your time? Because you are doing mm. so much. Like, how do you do it? Um, everyone calls me the dot point queen. So um, I, when I'm briefed on things, I need it just needs dot points. Yeah, just <laughs> right. top level dot points because yep. yep, you're right. I don't have a lot of time. Um, and I need to condense my time into what I call just little boxes. Yep. So, um, and look, I love what I do. So it makes it very easy um, for me in that sense. Um, but you've just got to, yeah, put, uh, just put the time in, but make sure that you're looking after the right spot. I always say with boards, um, the board is there to be strategic and to look after governance, not to get into the operational stuff. Mm. Um, and that's the same with Maccas. I don't get into the day-to-day operations. I just look after the financial side. So from that aspect, um, I'm able to handle my days pretty well. Yep. hundred mm. percent. Is there any tools that you're using to add it like calendars, obviously? Oh, yeah, with the yeah, way of technology's course, going. yeah. Um, I tend to write a lot. I do write things down. A lot of people go very electronic and mm. I do to a certain extent, but I prefer my own handwriting. So, and plus half the time I store it all in my head. So I know where I'm at every day. Yeah. hundred mm. percent. Well, if we're going to dial back a bit, go back from the start, I'm pretty sure you guys are from Adelaide. That's your yeah, stopping I was, grounds. I was born in Sydney. Um, I moved to Adelaide when I was about 13 and then I met Tony at university in Adelaide at Flinders Uni. Right. So what were you doing at university? Um, at Bachelor of Arts. Bachelor of Arts, okay. Yeah. And I didn't complete it. I went to two years and a half and then decided that that wasn't going to get me anywhere in business. So being a BA, it was general. I was doing mathematics psychology and Italian. Now, what's that going to get you? Nothing back then. (laughs) So um, I moved on to a diploma in business, which is what's held me in good stead and continued to study along the way. When you were younger, Mm. were there any like early signs, like even your parents thinking you're going to be? No, not really. Uh, Mum and dad were, um, you know, they both came out from Italy um, when they were young. They had their own business. They were small business people. Um, So no, I wanted to be a vet. Um, and I actually got into veterinary science at the end of year 12, but the course had moved from Adelaide to Melbourne. So, and at that point I didn't think it was, um, I just wasn't ready to leave home yet. Um, so that's where I moved over to a Bachelor of Arts at Flinders Uni. Yep. Okay. Yep. And then, like you said, you met Tony at university. Yep. Mm. I guess, how did you, where did you go from there? Was he very business minded too? Um, not at the time. He was mucking around at uni all the time. <laughs> Um, he was a bit of a larrikin and that's probably what attracted me to him. He made me laugh all the time. So, um, but his dad was in real estate. So he decided to leave uni as well um, and went in with his dad into real estate. And that's where he got his, his business um, background from. His dad was very good at it. um, And he taught Tony a lot. So did you guys get into business together to start with? No, not at all. No, I started working for an accountant. Then I moved over to the ANZ Bank and worked in the international department of the ANZ Bank. Um, And then a few years later, um, Tony's father and his business partner bought a, what would you call it? Back then it was a flag motel winery restaurant. Five star, what you would call in a core five star restaurant. complex and they brought me in to run reception for Mm -hmm. them Um, and then I took over as general manager a few years later 
And that gave me, I guess, probably the biggest insight into business and how business worked um, and what I needed to do to get to where I wanted to be. Well, when you say like you learned those skills, like mm. what skills are we talking about? Um, well, finance, obviously, people skills, being able to talk to anyone at any time um, because there'd be a lot of nights where we'd get a lot of um, – corporate travellers that would come and they'd sit in the bar and, you know, they wanted people to talk to. So, you'd, you know, you'd stand behind the bar and have a chat to them. Mm. So being able to talk to people at all levels um, but also being able to be a good manager because obviously you have a lot of staff, whether they be housekeeping staff, restaurant staff, winery staff. So um, I needed to look after all of those guys as well. So I learnt a lot. I definitely find that one thing that's helped me with my business is my past experience of like doing bartending and working at bakery and personal mm -hmm. uh, well, service with people mm -hmm. anyway, talking, negotiating and, you know, exchanging payment and all that. Yep. I feel like those fundamentals or those foundations help you later on in life. Do. Yeah, of course so they I do. So I guess is that what you recommend people to do when they're even younger? Like, Well, I mean, I can't re recommend Maccas more, can I? Yeah. <laughs> um, we run very, very good training programs through McDonald's. So um, and it, you end up with, I think it's a Cert 2, I'm not sure, you know, um, you'll need to ask about that. But um, what it does do, it enables you to learn about business, um, learn how to, you know, McDonald's is a good place to learn how to run shifts, how to handle money, how to handle people. Um, so I would recommend most kids going through school when you get to year 9, 10, 11, um, get a part-time job. Now, whether it be McDonald's or Big W or Kmart, it doesn't matter. Just get out there and um, learn, basically. Yep. Mm. So after that first business, mm. where'd you go from there? Well, I was fortunate enough to be suggested for the um, Telstra Businesswoman of the Year. So um, not knowing that I'd ever been um, suggested for it, but anyway, I, I put in obviously the application and I won. Um, so I won the state award and then went to the national awards, but didn't win those. But I met some fantastic people along the way. Absolutely amazing. Tony and I, about 18 months later, decided to leave Adelaide and move up to Queensland. So it was either Queensland or New South Wales, but we thought Queensland for Tony's background in real estate would be the best thing. So we moved up to the Gold Coast and he um, got a job working in commercial real estate and I started working in Brisbane. So I... Worked a few jobs. I couldn't quite decide what I wanted to do. And then I got a job at Westpac, just in their um, business sales area to start with. But I happened to be at a luncheon sitting next to the West uh, Westpac CEO. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know how. I think, I think I was just a seat filler, to be honest. Um, anyway, he started chatting about the strategy of Westpac. And I said, well, look, one thing that you don't do very well is look after women in business. So, you know, it's a strategy, it's a market, it's a very lucrative market, but you need to change the way that you do business to mm. be able to look after women. So needless to say, the following morning, I was asked into his office and he said, all right, put it down on paper how you want to do it. And we started the Women in Business program wow. in Westpac. And I guess that's what really started my career. Um, we launched it. Um, I was asked by... Um, yeah, basically to launch it. And then I got the premier at the time, Peter Beattie, to launch it for us. But basically it was a program that supported women in business and it focused on um, getting mentor support. So support from accountants, lawyers, business people um, to help them take their business to another level. And the issue with women is asking for money. When they're in their own business, they have a really hard time asking for money. So yeah, okay. they'll do the job, they'll do it really, really well. Mm. Um, but when it comes to getting payment, they find that really hard. So um, because they don't, yeah, they they just don't have that um, inherent, um, I don't know, vibe in them. I don't know what you call it, but it's. Um, so we tried to help them, and that was part of the program, and it ran really well. I ended up going national which was great um, and um, I loved it. It was great fun. So what, what strategies did you put in place that helped women? Um, so we helped them from a financial point of view, putting them on, you know, simple things like, you know, um, instead of having 30-day accounts, they would have seven-day accounts and that was the key thing. Right. Um, they could actually sell themselves and their business but then asking for the money in return was really difficult. I think that's probably changed a lot these days. You know, when you think about it, that's over 20, 25 years ago now, so it's a long time. Um, and it was when women were slowly starting to get more recognition 
So it was right back then. But I think it's better now um, and <clears throat> I think the banks have realised that it is quite a lucrative market, same as any other market that the bank goes after. Um, so they're doing a lot more to put strategies in place to help women. I guess having this massive success, you could say, yeah, uh, with Westpac, <laughs> that definitely boost your career even further? Yeah, it did. It put me on notice with government um, and at that time I got a phone call from the Premier's office asking if I wanted to be on his board, his industry board. Um, so I said yes, of course, because, you know, it would be a really, really interesting thing. I remember my first meeting, it was very, very scary, very daunting, but I did my research and found out who was also on the board and it was all industry experts or CEOs from around Queensland. Um, and I did a lot of research on their behalf um, to find out so I could walk into the room and actually have a conversation with them because mm. I was the youngest in the room. Yep, I love that. I, yeah. I just want to touch on that. There's a guy that I watch from America, Alex Lamozzi, very successful man, mid-30s. He just talks about that so much like you'd be amazed how much five minutes preparation just looking at someone's background can do for you. It's exactly right. And um, pardon me, sorry, I've got a cough. Um, what... So I could walk into the room with, say, Lindsay Fox, who was in the room, who's the big, you know, guy from Melbourne who has a big transport company and he owns airports and everything, and walk up to him and say hello and shake his hand and ask him about his family mm. or what he's been doing. So um, all these people were at that level and here's Lindley only me. And somehow strategically I got put straight across from the Premier on my first meeting. Mm. So, But as everyone knows, I can talk. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> everyone knows that. So um, that wasn't the issue. It was more about the topics. I wanted to understand the topics that he was talking about, what the agenda was of the day. So we worked through a lot of that um, and that worked really, really well. Um, because of that, I was invited to join the Premier on many trade missions after that. Mm. Um, and after Westpac, I started working for Accenture. So Accenture are like a... Um, they're an IT firm basically that install a lot of um, big programs into government um, and elsewhere. So if you think about an IBM or something similar, but um, and I was looking after their government relations at the time. So it was advantageous for me to travel on trade missions um, to find out what the government was doing and where the opportunities were. So I travelled all over the world with the Premier over nine years. Wow. Um, which was fantastic and a real eye-opener. And there's a lot of stories I can't tell you. Um, <laughs> so and things, what, what do they say? What goes on tour stays on tour? Yep, yep. No, nothing sinister. But um, I learned a lot. I met with a lot of businesses overseas. Um, it just broadened my whole um, horizon when it came to business and how it operated and international business and how they worked with government to either get, whether it's importing, exporting, or what we needed to do to get more business into Queensland to grow Queensland. So. I, I guess like, uh, I might be wrong, but like this all seemed like it happened very quick in your career. Like it came, it, it was just like one thing after another. Mm. How do you feel like, oh, and you would have been just leveling up, leveling mm. up your game instantly, instantly. Mm. Were there ever times where you just look back and like at a certain time period, like over 18 months, you're like, holy, like mm -hmm. I've come this far. All the like, time. And you're just trying to like soak it in. Like how do you, how do you stay focused, I guess, because it can get distracting and put you off? It can. And it's, um, you know, both my husband were, my husband at that point, um, we had bought into McDonald's. So he was working very hard, long hours. Um, so was I. So, um, yeah, taking stock, you don't get a lot of time to take stock. You just keep moving. Um, I, look, I, I love what I do. So it made it very easy for me to mm. keep going and keep doing things. Um, I met some incredibly interesting people and I listened. That's the whole, you know, the whole thing about business or just every day is just to keep learning. You learn from everybody that you meet. It doesn't matter who it is, you learn. And you treat everybody with respect. Um, and that helped me along the way. As I said before, everyone knows I can talk my way through most things. Um, but I love people. I love talking with people. I love walk, working with people. So for me, it was it was just a keep stepping forward. That's all. Just keep stepping forward and, you know, gather it. I actually had, when I worked for, and I didn't work for Optus Vision for very long um, at the time because they weren't in um, business for very long, but they offered me a 
um, a spot similar to this where, but it was actually on video. So it was on community video. So I was interviewing people as well. Um, and, but mainly women, we called it, um, women with vision. Cool. And, um, so I learned a lot from them as well. So I kept trying different things. Um, and I think that's good is open all the opportunities, try Mm. things. You never know where it's going to lead. So don't block yourself off and just have one path. Um, People you meet will take you down another path and it might not be the right path for you, but at least you know that Mm. and then you can keep going. A lot of trial and error. Yeah, that's right. It's right. You know, there's a lot of people that come through and, you know, all they want to be is a lawyer. Fantastic. Be a lawyer. But have a look at the opportunities for lawyers, not just in a law firm, but Mm. in, you know, in small business, in big business, in exporting business, you know, there's in government, there's so many opportunities for being a lawyer, not just a law firm. 100%. And I want to come back to, like you said, you were traveling the world for nine Mm. nine years there. You would have been meeting world leaders from countries of what type, like Um, China? Well, um, no, we never did China, but we did America, obviously Europe, um, I didn't go to the Middle East because it was very, you know, at that stage it mm. was it was a little bit harder for women. Yep. Um, did Japan though, Singapore, Malaysia. So, yeah, we met quite a few people. Um, just little things like following their culture. Um, when my first trip ever was to Japan and one of the things is when you go into a business meeting in Japan, usually the gentlemen are the ones that are, addressed first and then the females. It's just their culture. It's what the way it is. You can't get upset about that. Mm. You have to understand that that's their culture. That's how they operate and you adjust to that. Same as you would want them to come into Australia and do, you know, what our culture is. So um, so I learned a lot from that aspect. And, yes, we did meet quite a few people. It was really interesting. Mm. I met um, Rudy Giuliani once um, in New York who was the mayor at the time, but he just happened to be um, at the restaurant but in another spot at the restaurant, okay. but he came over to say hello which was really cool. I guess dealing with these people, like, do you get much into like human nature? Yeah. Like the, yeah. So what what are the main skills that you, I talk about skills a lot because I just love mm-hmm. the idea of skills. Mm-hmm. What skills did you either learn or incorporate over time? Like when you're dealing with people listen, face to face? Listen, watch facial expressions. Um, I spent over 20 years being a government relations expert. So in the sense that I would mediate between government and business um, so sitting down, looking, it's it's basically being a mediator in a lot of ways. So looking at the expressions on the face, looking at what their agendas are, what their needs are, and just, to be honest, it's really just listening and mm. listening deep. Um, and that's how you learn to read people and you know that if you're on track doing the right thing or if you're not on track doing, you know, the right thing and how you can move the meeting around so it suits everybody. Yeah, I know that Robert Greene, like in the 48 Laws of Power, gives all the laws and then the last law is be formless, you know, mm-hmm. act act to your environment. Like that's you exactly can't right. just rely on the <laughs> laws. Like you have that's to be right. formless. Yeah, says. just, you know, gut feeling. It, you know, people. a lot of people go, oh, you can't rely on, you do rely on your gut feeling. Mm. You know, if you walk into a situation and you're unsure, then read it, see what you're unsure about and work through it. Mm. Yeah, and your gut feeling will take you everywhere. Yep, so you've done nine years. Uh, going to America, Japan, mm-hmm. all these amazing experience. What was the next chapter for you? Um, what did we do? We moved up to uh, oh, I Peter Beatty at that time um, stepped down as premier, and I moved to working for Leighton Contractors. Leighton Contractors are a big contracting company. We built bridges, roads underground busways in Brisbane and whatever, still in a government relations role. So my roles were quite often government relations. Um, So working with state government, federal government, local government. So I continued to do that. And then my husband and I had an opportunity. We'd had um, two McDonald's on the Gold Coast. We had an opportunity to move up to Gladstone um, and have four McDonald's stores. And that's um, when I stopped doing government relations basically. Yeah, I moved up here and I actually, there was a firm that worked for me while I was at Leighton's and I ended up working for them part-time when I moved up here. Mm. Um, so I flew back weekly or, you know, every second week. And then after about 12 months, I think I need a, I need a break. Yep. So I took time off work for about 18 months, um, got into community work in Gladstone, which yep. was great for me. And I learned and I met the community, which was really great. 
I guess going from like you've grown up, oh, sorry, started in Sydney, Adelaide, mm-hmm. then you're living in the Gold Coast slash Brisbane, moving to Gladstone, like a town of, you know, 30, 40,000 people. What was that change like for you? I miss food. <laughs> <laughs> I miss food. The um, that's what I said to everybody. Yeah. I miss yeah. cafes. I miss restaurants. Yep. Oh, look, the Glad- I love the Gladstone community and, you know, um, I love being here. I have no wish, you know, I really do enjoy being here. My issue is food. So it's funny. We had friends in Rockhampton um, that um, used to travel and they'd say to me, I'd book all my restaurants ahead. And I go, why do you do that? Because we were living on the Gold Coast at the time, full of restaurants. You know, mm. I worked in Brisbane, full of restaurants. Didn't think anything of it. Then we moved to Gladstone. Well, yes, now I book my restaurants in advance. I know exactly where I want to go. Yep. Um, so that's that's the one thing I miss. Um, Gladstone's great, though. The beauty about it is we're on the water. We're not far away from anything. We're a 50-minute flight to Brisbane. Mm. Um, it's a great community up here and everyone looks after each other. So, um, and it's been very good to Tony and I. So, you know, we can't be more thankful. We love it here. I guess that's one thing, like, it's very easy to network to and get to know everyone. It is. It is. Um, You've got to be careful, though, because then everyone knows your own business. Yes. No, No, joking. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But, um, yes, it is easier to get. And people are more relaxed. Mm. Um, That's what I find more than anything. They're a lot more relaxed. It's, well, I guess Brisbane's all go go, mm-hmm. or city life anyway, very go go. It is, and a lot more cutthroat, a lot more cutthroat. Um, and if you're not there all the time, that's one of the reasons I stopped doing government relations with what I do. You need to be there all the time. You need to be at events, you need to be talking to everybody, you know, all the time. And when you're removed from that, it's a little bit hard to do. So, but what I love about Gladstone is, yes, you're right, everyone knows everybody, we support each other um, and we've got a great community here. Mm. Mm. What, do you, what do you say to people that like someone like for myself when I was younger who wanted to just run to the city because we thought all the opportunity was there but a lot mm. of it's actually here. Mm-hmm. What, do you actually, what do you say to those people? Go. Go. Enjoy it. Um, go for a couple of years, spread your wings. Um, I always say to my daughter, I would love her to finish university and then head overseas for a couple of years. Experience the world, but then come home. Come home and bring all that experience back to home. There's nothing wrong with you want to see, I mean, we always talk about the grass is greener. Everybody does that. And if you don't have that opportunity to go to Brisbane for a couple of years and work and explore, you'll always wonder So I actually believe whether it be in boarding school, university or whatever, if you need to step out of Gladstone for a couple of years because you want to see what else is out there, Mm. go for it and then bring all that experience and all that knowledge back home to Gladstone. Yeah, definitely. Mm. That's definitely a different perspective. I think a lot of people don't take that just like, oh, I just want to get away from here and never come back. No. It's home. It's home. Um, It's... Look, you build your home as your sanctuary and if you want to get away from the rat race, it's a lot easier in Gladstone, I believe, to actually just come home and relax. We love travelling. My husband and I, my daughter now, um, we love travelling, absolutely, but we love coming home. There's nothing better than actually getting off that plane and getting back to your own home. Um, And Gladstone's a very slowed down. The one thing when we moved here, I used to drive from Gold Coast to Brisbane every day for work. An hour and a half each way. I used to be on the phone. When I first started, we only had pages. So you used to have to stop at a telephone, you know, box when they had telephone boxes and ring in and find out what was going on. Then as the, obviously we got mobile phones and I could talk to everybody. I remember when we got here, I had to go to the airport to pick somebody up and it's like a five-minute trip. And I'm on the phone to somebody and go, oh, I've got to go. Sorry, guys, I'm already here. I wasn't quite used to the short distances. So it enables us actually to do a lot more in Gladstone Mm. than it does if you're in the city because you are travelling a lot and it takes a long time to get everywhere. Yeah, definitely. It is quite like that, um, 10 minutes here and there. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh, wow. Or yep. Brisbane, and then you got to left for traffic too, like in accidents, they're always mm. like not accounted for a that's lot of right. time. Yeah, that's why we're very fortunate. But, yeah, I, I still have that philosophy. Go away for a couple of years, um, a year, two years or whatever, whether it be at university or whether it be just travelling and working. Um, but bring all that knowledge back to Gladstone and mm. help us develop the community here with that knowledge. Well, if someone wanted to get into business, would you still recommend uni? 
or do you think they should get more life skills like both in positions? Okay. Both. Both. Um, look, it depends on what they want to do. If you want to be a lawyer, an accountant or whatever, then of course you've got to do some university. If you want to be in business, um, not so much, but still do some quality learning on the side. Now, whether that be with a management organisation, whether that be with the Institute of Company Directors, um, where you know those sort of things, you still need to get that knowledge, um, but you don't need to do it full time. It's it's entirely up to you. It's entirely it's relative to the business that you want to go in. Mm. Mm. And we are still in a quite you would say male dominant business world. Would you say? Mm-hmm. So females trying to make their work their way up and are competing against males. What are those tips of advice? Like, obviously, you want to keep ego out of the way. That's definitely one. Um, but what are some other couple of little tips? Um, look, there's a couple of things that I have strong beliefs about. They have quotas all the time when it comes to, and it was something I used to argue with government all the time, don't put quotas in because they don't work. Um, for me, if I'm on a board, I want the right people on the board, whether it be a male or a female. I will obviously encourage females to come through, but if they don't have the industry experience that you need for that board um, and the skill base that they don't need, it'll actually be a hindrance, not a not a help. So we have to keep, as females, we have to keep developing ourselves. We have to keep encouraging ourselves um, and we have to support each other because, you know, back in my day, God, it makes me sound old, <laughs> um, 20 years ago women didn't support each other yeah. um, on boards and they they wanted to be the sole person on that board. My view is that a board needs to have an equal amount of females and males, but they need both sides need to have the right skill base and the right industry experience. Um, it's, yeah, it's not step on each other's shoulders, just actually support each other coming through. And I'm very keen to mentor people and, you know, give them the guidance that mm. takes them to the next level. Very happy with that. When it comes to women in corporate, um, and I was in corporate for a long time, there's a bit of a fallacy, I think, in place that women can't get to the top. It's not that women can't get to the top. It's that they get bogged down with, and it's that's a horrible word, but it's it's family, right? Women are the ones that get pregnant. Women mm. are the ones that have the baby. Most of the time, the women for the first year are feeding the baby. So that does stall their career to a certain extent. And not that there's anything wrong with it because, you know, I have no issue with any of that. It's just a fact. That's what it is. If men could have babies, it would be different, but <laughs> they can't. Um, and um, or maybe they can in the future. Who knows? But, yeah, it's so whilst we don't see as many women in the corporate um, world at a top level, um, we do see a lot as well. But what do they have to sacrifice along the way? Mm. And that's that's the hard, that's the really hard part. Yeah, and I don't think there's a strong answer for either side. Yeah, I guess do you think that mindset's still a limiter for females? Yeah, that I belief? think so. Yeah, yeah I think so. Um, I don't know whether that'll change. I'm not sure. It's anatomy is the way it is and, you know, and okay, you can get pregnant, have a baby and then put the baby into childcare immediately, which mm. that's fine if that's what you want to do. As I said, I have, I don't have any beliefs either way. It's what works for you. But... Um, then you, you know, you might sit back and regret it in a few years time, or you might not, that's fine. But it's, it's something that every individual has to decide for themselves. Mm. Mm. Do you believe that the corporate corporate world is definitely shifting more to just looking at people for their skills and not so much their agenda? I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. I don't know. Cause I haven't been in the true corporate world for a while, but, um, I hope so. I really do because we have so many skilled, both males and females and, you know, whatever gender you want to discuss um, that could do wonders for organisations but not having any biases is hard for people. Yeah. What what have been the new challenges since, like, taking on your role at the chair? Sorry, was the chair of the water board you stood yep. down from? No, no, the no. chair of the water board, I'm still there. Yep. Um, well, I've only been there for probably 18 months. Yep. Um, and the airport, I've been there for quite a while um, as chair, but um, I'm very fortunate that I've got two great CEOs 
um, one who you've already spoken to, Mark Hatter, <laughs> um, and the other one is Darren Barlow. They are brilliant CEOs um, and we have a very good working relationship. And I always, a philosophy that I've always had is the chair needs to trust the CEO and the CEO needs to trust the chair. Mm. So if you can have that relationship um, and work together well, then everything else folds in un- underneath. I guess <laughs> like like the new challenges you're po- probably facing is funding one of them because we are in such a regional yeah, area? Um, they're a little bit different organisations um, because they're, um, they're government-owned. Mm. So, um, yes, funding is yeah a big deal for any government-owned, whether it be a government-owned corporation or a business-owned corporation or a state authority or whatever you want to call them. Um, yes, funding is always an issue from the state government or federal government, but you just got to keep it pushing through. That's all. Um, you know, at the end of the day, the water board is there to benefit the organisation, um, benefit the community, mm-hmm. um, and look after the community. And um, same with the airport. Yeah, yep. the airport we're a thoroughfare. Um, we are basically there to help airlines put people on planes, yep. and that's what we do. I guess you've been involved in many community-focused organisations. So, how do you balance corporate success with giving back to the community? They're two totally different things. Um, but you can balance them together um, by getting money from corporates <laughs> to help the community. Mm. Um, and that, that's the thing. Um, the only issue is we don't have as much governance around community organisations as what we do around a board, around a formal board of some such, whether it be a business board or a government board. So you get a lot of agendas around the table. So if you've got a committee, um, I find a lot of the time they have their own agendas, the people have their own agendas and they're not there for the good of the community as a whole and for the good of the organisation. Yep. Um, so that's the only part that I don't like about community organisations but it's the role of a good chair of a community organisation is to weed those people out and get the people that are there for the right reasons that actually want to um, – increase the number of people that are a part of that organisation, whether it be a sport, whether it be a, an art, you know, there's so many different community organisations where it be in health or whatever. Yep. But you've got to get, the, again, get the right people around the table who actually want to benefit the organisation, not themselves. Yeah, 100%. Mm-hmm. Another thing that too that's a major issue at the moment, I guess, is the trust in like news and, and the government mm-hmm. and politics and that. I guess, can we break through from that? Is there a recovery? Um, I don't think so. Um, I don't know. I think the the media has a lot to do with it. You're only hearing snippets, especially what's happening with overseas at the moment. We only hear one side or the other or what actually what is actually really going on. Um, and people tend to follow one belief because it's their own belief and mm. they tend to gather information to support that belief rather than actually looking across the board and saying, well, hey, I might not be right. This actually may happen. So it's a hard one. Um, it depends on how much you want to delve into it. I'm not sure it's going to change in a hurry, but the only people that can change it is us. Yep. And stop listening to Instagram and TikTok and, you know, everything that's on there that doesn't benefit what needs to happen. Mm. And um, I like how you mentioned social media because it's also mm-hmm. a major distraction today for people who want to focus and mm-hmm. just get their work done and focus. Mm-hmm. So are there any, you reckon you got any tips and tricks? No, um, <laughs> the only thing, I mean, we've got a 13-year-old um, who has no social media whatsoever. So um, we've just decided that the later we can leave her getting onto social media, the better because it can be very cruel. Um, and you know, as, as you're a teenager, you're very impressionable, you're very emotional. So, um, we, we might, you know, sound like strict parents, but, and we are in a lot of ways, but the more that we can keep her off social media, the benefit, you know, because that way our daughter goes out and finds things out for herself rather than just reading them on social media Mm. and they can be so biased, but, Yes, it can be very detrimental. And when you, you know, in the schools, you know that there's so much going on, whether it be bullying or, you know, anything like that. And a lot of it comes from social media and it's really, really sad. And we saw the other night, I think on the news, that they're staging bashings of kids so they can tape them and put them on social media. Yep. 
Yeah. Which is oh, so wrong. Mm. Mm. As much as there's like many negatives about social media, mm. there's definitely the positives. And mm. I guess like in the corporate world and business world, it's definitely a great way to advertise and get the message out there. Absolutely. Um, but it depends on what part of social media you're using, what avenue you're using. Mm. So, you know, I would say if you're looking for business um, advice or business ideas, go to LinkedIn. Um, although it could become a little bit of a dating site. I've had a couple of approaches. <laughs> like, yeah, for God's sake. Um, but um, it's um, it's more business focused. Yep. So go on to there and find out what's going on with the world through that. Mm. Yeah, I definitely found it as a life hack. Hey? It's um, crazy that you can just, you know, look up people and their roles and positions and you can just connect with them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's a game changer for people who are new in business to want right. to get themselves out there. That's right. And I, I think it's fantastic. I think it's fantastic, you know. And the thing is not making yourself accessible is not the right thing to do. Mm. You know, um, we can teach, you know, I've still got a lot of learning to do. I've still got a lot of work that I want to do. And I'm learning from other people that have been doing the things that I've been doing and continue to do so. So I'm hoping that people can do the same with me and utilise me and what I've done to help them along the way as well. And I'm always there, put up my hand and say, yep, yep, if you need to have a chat, um, you know, you want some help with something, I'm there. Mm. Mm. I guess you can say biz- business is in your blood, both yours and Tony's. So for, say, a new entrepreneur, young or old, who wants to get in the business what from the ground up, how would you build that business? Um, market research first. Find out if you're, what you want to build up is actually needed in the market. If it's not, then it's going to be very hard to slog for you. Um, have a look what's around, what differentiates yourself from anybody else because um, there's so many businesses that open up and don't do their research, do their SWOT analysis as we call it. Mm. Um, do that first before you even put any money into it at all. And then if you find that there's a need and this is something that you want, um, then slowly build up, do some business courses. So your finance is your biggest one. Finance and marketing are your two biggest ones, but obviously the product as well. So if you focus on those three and try and get as much information, as much learning as you can over the three, then and then just learn from other people around you. Get some mentors. You know, um, Tony got, when we first moved into Maccas, um, the reason we got, and he'll explain this to you, is we knew some people in Rotary that were in McDonald's. Mm. Um, so, and they became Tony's mentors for a lot of years. So he learnt from them. So find people in the industry that can help you that aren't frightened of you being in there and taking over their portfolio or their business but actually want to help you grow or anything that's adjacent to your um, industry as well. Mm, yeah, I definitely mm. like that. Find that starving crowd, I guess. Um, mm. a, a natural, you could say, business strategy or niche where there's people there with the purchasing power as well. Because that's another thing too. I, f- I find a lot of people get into business and they are – they target the wrong audience. Mm, that's right. Say an audience that does not have <clears throat> the, the money or the cash flow mm-hmm. to be able to pay you what you're worth. That's right. Exactly. So you need to recognize that straight away and walk away from it before you actually put the money in um, because otherwise you're you're feeding something that's not going to go anywhere. Mm. Yeah. What's another way do you think you've – obviously you've been – you've had CEOs, I can imagine, or many CEOs have probably been your mentors – What's another way that people are able to maybe access mentors or find them? And um, It could be in Rotary. Um, in Rotary, what I find, um, and obviously I'm not in Rotary, um, my husband is, but um, there's a lot of people that have either been in business or are currently in business or retired and they're good people to talk to as well. Um, different business organisations, um, people in your family, mm-hmm. you know, that have been involved. Anyone that you can sit down and you – my grandfather was um, – he was probably my biggest mentor for many, many years. He um, brought the family out from Italy during World War II um, and they settled in um, Ethiopia at the time um, in Addis Ababa and that's where my mum was born. Um, even though I've got Italian heritage, she was actually born there. Then he brought the whole family out to Australia and he was a cook in the army so he didn't have a lot of skill base but he went back to university and he became a professor of languages. So he could speak five languages and teach five languages. Wow. Yep. Yeah, amazing man. Um, met his second wife at uni. She was a counsellor there and they were, you know, they they were together since I was one. Um, so a long time ago. And, I mean, he's passed away now for over 20 years. But he um, 
he was my greatest mentor because he could, I could bring my friends home and he could talk to anybody. He taught me a lot. He could talk to all my mates, you know, and have a chat to them. He taught at my school at one stage, which was really weird, <laughs> walking into a classroom to learn Italian and there's my grandfather, you know. Um, but he was, he reinvented himself in a lot of ways um, and he taught at the seminary for the Latin, you know, Latin um, for the priests. Amazing, amazing man. Um, and I think there's always one person in your family that, you know, will help you or whether you actually go into the same industry they're in or whether they just help you through business, um, talk to them, talk to them because we've all been through highs and lows all the time. I mean, that's just a nature of business. Um, so they can give you both sides of it. As well as mentors, what are other ways that you've found have been the best resources for learning either books or online courses? Online courses, definitely, or um, in-your-face courses, as I said, attending courses. Um, attending, I, um, I'm i a member of the um, Central Queensland AICD committee, so the Institute of Company Directors Committee. So um, we try and promote Institute of Company Directors here in Central Queensland because they do a lot of really good courses for business. Um, but I find every two years I do a refresher course and I do it face-to-face -face in Brisbane because it refreshes all the areas that I need refreshing. It could be new financial, you know, things that have come through, tax stuff. Um, it could be environment, you know, ESG that's become the big thing at the moment, which is all about environmental. Um, it could be anything that I don't either I've, I'm not on the ball or it's changed a lot. Um, but also the thing is with attending those courses, you get to meet other people that are in the same boat as you mm. um, and you get to broaden your networks as well. So either online or face-to-face -face is good, but focus on the ones that are going to benefit you. Yep. And I guess is another skill that you've maybe learned is what well, I feel like is very important is reputation in your brand. Mm -hmm. Yep. What ways or how important is your reputation in your oh, brand? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Huge, huge. It's the number one, to be honest. Um, I've actually stepped down from boards um, that haven't been acting in the way that they should have um, because I didn't want my reputation tainted with that board. Um, so it's um, you need to sometimes, because boards isn't about ego, it isn't about how many you sit on. It's one, can you benefit the organisation? Um, can you learn from the organisation? Um, and secondly, if that's not working, and you're not in a position to keep your reputation as it is, then step away. Yeah, I can't say any more, but that's basically, yeah, I've stepped away. Yeah. Is there ways you can recover your reputation, do you think, if you've, if it's maybe been tainted? You know, yeah. Mm, um, probably. Yeah, probably. I'm fortunate enough, touch wood down here, um, <laughs> that I haven't had to do that. But um, yes, but it does take time. It does take time. Yeah, yep, definitely. Mm -hmm. Where do you see the future of business going in, say, global, 10, 20 years? Global, more global. Global, yep. easier to access. I mean, God, social media will say that. Everyone is on Zoom these days. I mean, if anything that COVID taught us is you can do everything online. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to be face-to-face -face all the time. Um, so from that opportunity, I think, yeah, it'll be a lot more global, easier access, um, hopping onto committees, um, boards can be a lot easier if, um, you don't have to be in the room anymore. Mm. Mm. Definitely. And what was, what's the future hold for you guys or even yourself? Oh, God knows. Um, <laughs> we, um, one of the things that coming up to Gladstone gave us the opportunity to adopt a little girl. Um, so Willow was seven when we adopted her. So she's now 13 going through the teenage years, but doing pretty well actually. Um, so we'll see Willow through school. She's in grade seven at the moment. Um, and then we'll make a decision after that. We're not in any hurry. We're not in any hurry to leave Gladstone or do anything. We enjoy being here. Um, I guess from my point of view at the moment is making sure that Willow stays on the straight and narrow, um, doesn't stray. And then I don't know where she'll be. She hasn't quite decided what she wants to do with her life at the moment. She's working a couple of days a week at Macca's, which is great. So it teaches her a good work ethic. Mm. Um, so she does that after school. So um, 
Yeah, I, I honestly don't know. I love what I do at the moment and opportunities always come up. Opportunities, you know, I have, um, I've had the fortune of having those happen as needed. Yep. Um, so, but I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing now because I love it. I love the airport. The airport's fun. <laughs> it's, um, we've, since Mark came on board our CEO, we've really turned the place around. Yep. Um, when I first took over as chair, um, I had to turn it upside down because um, there was yeah, some things that shouldn't be happening that were happening. Anyway, we went through a couple of CEOs and finally um, Mark came on board and we've had a really good steady stream since then. So um, he's done an amazing job at the airport. So I really, really enjoy that. And everyone who comes, all our board members say, oh, we love coming to the meetings because they, they're they just good. Um, water board, um, I'm still learning, still learning. Um, it's a lot of information about water. Um, and all the legislation, everything that comes around it, because, you know, in a couple of years we'll have the Fitzroy to Gladstone pipeline built, yep. which is from Rocky to Gladstone. Um, so we're going to have a lot of um, infrastructure and assets to look after. Um, we need to look after the community, that's our primary, and look after industry here in Gladstone. So um, I'm still learning every day on little nuances that happen within the water industry. So, but enjoying it too, actually. I didn't think I'd actually like water, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I am. So that's been really good. And getting to know the team and, as I said, the CEO, fantastic. Um, he and I work really well together and his knowledge from a legislation point of view is fantastic. So, um, yeah, I think um, I'll just keep enjoying what I'm doing at the moment, helping my daughter grow. Mm. Um, and the biggest thing for me is travel. I love travelling. And because Willow came from a, um, a foster care background, obviously, you know. Um, she hadn't had the opportunity to travel until she met us. So she comes with us all on our travels everywhere now. So watching her grow and appreciate life and appreciate things is is great for us. I guess what do you go to countries when it comes to travel? Oh, Europe, Italy, yeah. obviously, because I can speak the language. It makes <laughs> me easy for me. Um, I love Europe. Um and America, probably the key two. One of the ones I want to do is Alaska. I want to go up and have a look up there. Um, my husband and I recently did a cruise, um, which we really enjoyed, but I like prefer to be on the ground. I prefer to come out of my hotel and go to the local coffee shop. Yeah, yeah I find a cruise is a little bit too sanitised for Stuck me. Stuck on a boat. <laughs> um, but I'm glad we tried it and did it. Um, I think give us 10, 20 years and maybe we'll look at doing more of them. But right now um, I just rather, what about you? What do you, do you like traveling? Oh yeah. hundred percent. hundred percent. Yeah. Whereabouts? Um, done a little bit of Europe. That was more for like swimming. Mm. So it was quite restricted. We were more just training. Yeah. Uh, we did a little bit of travel here and there, but it was just more specifically focused on swimming. Yeah. <laughs> um, been to Bali. Mm. Um, that's pretty much it. But I do look at spreading my wings and going to Europe. And like you said, get those experiences and then come back home That's with right. those experiences. Exactly. And I think, you know, having having some worldly knowledge and meeting people, you know, um, I've now taught my daughter, God help me, I shouldn't have done that, to say hello to people in lifts, you know, because I always walk in and say good morning or good afternoon or whatever. And um, last time we were in a lift in Sydney and um, a gentleman walked in in a uniform and she said, are you from the army? And, um, oh no, she did say, she was actually quite polite. She said, good morning, are you from the army? And he said, no, I'm from the Navy. And he said, you know, we're blue, the army's green, blah, blah, blah. And she goes, well, you learn something new every day <laughs> <laughs> and had everybody laughing in there. So, you know, it's, it's just enabling people to enjoy, mm. to learn and to meet new people because you just don't know what's around the corner. Yep, 100%. Yeah, and that's what we want to teach Willow is just to keep doing that. Be open. Have a good, strong work ethic. Mm. Um, you know, you have to – we've – you know, Tony and I started with nothing basically when we got married. We were renting. You know, we had nothing. So – but we worked hard for many, many years to get to where we are. So, um, yeah, and I'd encourage everybody to do the same. Mm. Mm. Yeah, definitely from travelling too, I think just a realisation of appreciation. I've said this time and time again, but like going to Bali, like seeing how they live there and mm. you're like, wow, like third world country – it is quite crazy that they don't even have running tap water they can drink from. I know. And that's the sad part. If I was to do any more community work, I would probably want to do something. I'm an animal lover, always have been, um, and I always thought I'd send a, um, end up setting up a refuge farm 
here somewhere. Mm. Um, where for anim- not so much dogs and cats because they seem to be looked after in Gladstone, but more for farm animals yep. and, you know, different types of animals. So um, if I can't do that and that's not, then I'd like to put um, my efforts, I guess, and some money, obviously, efforts and money behind some organisations that do do things like that, that, you know, support people, support animals um, and do do a lot of good work there rather than reinventing the wheel, actually support them to grow. Do you find that doing like a lot of, like you could say charity work like that, that helps you grow as a person? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It keeps you grounded as well Mm. because, you know, yeah, look, as I said, we love what we do, but at the end of the day, we just live like normal people, you know, we're like, you know, we're all the same. We're all the same, just doing different jobs. So how can we support each other? And this is one way we can do that. Mm. Mm. Do you find as well that like, obviously you're quite successful financially as well, that Money is not the the actual answer. It's more, would you say, people yep. that you enjoy more about it? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I work from home, um, and I'm fortunate to work from home. So um, we have an office, obviously, for Maccas, but I don't tend to have to go in there every day. So we tend to, I tend to work from home for my other work. Um, but after a day at home, I need people. Yeah, I need people. I need to go out the next day and have meetings and or meet with people and catch up with people. I need that interaction because that's where I learn. Um, so yes, yeah, it's a very big thing for me. Uh, yeah. I think it's, I think a lot of people get into business for the wrong reasons. Mm. And I potentially could say that when I first got into entrepreneurship, same thing, it was more just like money, money, money. And that's mm. what social media has been, unfortunately, you know, injecting into us. That it's all about having the cars and the boats mm. and right. all this cool stuff. And it's yep. going to be more far from the truth. Yeah. Look, money makes life easier. I won't say that it doesn't, mm. it's a good but tool. it doesn't make it's you tool. happy. Yeah. Yep. And family and a sense of self, a sense of belief in yourself, a sense of, you know, we're never 100% happy with ourselves, whether it be cosmetically, whether it be physically, whether it be, you know, we haven't learnt enough, whether whatever. It's just that's just normal. That's human nature. But money is not going to fix that. Um, Happiness will. So how do you find your way of being happy? And everyone's different. Everyone's different. You know, I used to horse ride all the time um, and then I damaged my knee and I've had a knee replacement now and um, I shouldn't actually get on a horse again because if I fall off, my whole leg's going to go. Um, but I miss that. I miss the hugs of the horses. Mm. Um, yeah, I just miss spending time with them more than anything. So, you know, hopefully I'll go back and do that. Whether I ride again is another thing, but I may just cuddle. You know, because that makes me feel at peace. It Mm. does. There's something about animals that make me feel at peace. Mm. So, but everyone has, you know, you might surf, you know, you might go on a jet ski, you might do a run, you know, you might do yoga, you know, whatever. Everyone has their own ability to be happy and to be grounded. I guess take their mind off business or work and life anyway, or as well, sorry. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And you need, you need a balance and it's not easy. Don't get me wrong, it's not easy, you know, with our work that we do, we work 24 hours a day because that's Mm. what we do. But then, you know, I always say that I can work really, really hard as long as I have a holiday to look forward to. Um, Doesn't matter whether it's, you know, a couple of days down at Splitter's Farm or, you know, down at Bundy or it could be in Noosa, it could be on the Gold Coast, it could be Brisbane, it could be overseas. It doesn't matter. As long as I have a couple of days to look forward to, I'll work all the hours needed. Yes. Mm. To wrap up. Mm. Another awesome podcast. Uh, it's been great <laughs> to have you. <laughs> um, words of wisdom to anyone in business and life. Be yourself. That's the first thing I would always say. Just be yourself. Be true to yourself and do what you love. Um, and neither are easy, um, but if you can get to that, you'll be successful in whatever you do. Just give it a go. Absolutely. Um, Adrian Ward, appreciate it, Tom. Oh, it's been great. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you.